Welcome back. Get ready everyone, because today we're going to dive into the details of SpaceX's Starship Flight Test 6. This is a historic moment, and it's important that everyone understands the significance of this event. Can the world's largest and most powerful rocket exceed expectations? Will it achieve its mission-critical goals? Let's get started with Space Now Channel. Just a month ago, Ship 30 and Booster 12 took to space. Not only that, they captured the 70-meter-tall, 9-meter-wide booster on their first attempt, and the spacecraft's re-entry and landing were the most successful ever. If you're new to SpaceX, they're working on a launch system where the entire booster and upper stage can only deliver satellites and cargo to low Earth orbit, and it can be reused without having to throw away most of the rocket parts like before, except for a few special cases like the Space Shuttle, and the amazing Falcon boosters. Compared to the Saturn V, the rocket that took us to the moon, every launch had to throw away the entire vehicle, except for the Apollo crew capsule. Can you imagine if planes did that? Surely the ticket prices would be unimaginably expensive. Making costs lower and more accessible is the goal that SpaceX is aiming for with this space plane. And of course, when SpaceX launches Ship 31 and Booster 13, a major turning point in the journey of space exploration is about to take place. With SpaceX, the excitement and anticipation are always present. They have helped us have more economical and frequent space flights thanks to the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy rocket families. This is a step forward in partial reusability, with only the booster and fairing being recovered, but full reusability is the goal SpaceX is aiming for. Starship, with its massive size, is facing this challenge while attracting attention from increasingly large crowds of onlookers. This flight is expected to be similar to Flight 5 in many ways, but with Flight 6 there are some subtle differences for further testing. Especially the upper stage, which is Starship, with its re-entry and landing tests. This is an important element that no rocket on Earth has ever done. One of the less realized and impressive things about the Starship program is that SpaceX built most of the vehicle from stainless steel, a material that is much easier to handle and much cheaper than other heavy rockets in history. Not only does this make the production process faster, it also reduces costs significantly compared to other rockets. And in situations like this, if something goes wrong, it's much easier to repair. SpaceX's goal is to build these giant rockets in large numbers, bringing a breakthrough to the space industry. What do you think about the reusability of SpaceX rockets? Is this the future of space travel? Share your thoughts in the comments. Over the past five years, SpaceX has gradually transformed a small coastal settlement called Boca Chica near Brownsville, Texas into Starbase, the gateway to Mars. This is where the Starship launch pads and propellant farms are located. And right in sight is the Star Factory, a giant building under construction to mass-produce Starship components, preparing for final assembly at the megabase. And that's just the beginning, as SpaceX is also building a similar facility in Florida, near Cape Canaveral. When we look at the spacecraft preparing for its sixth flight, the scale of it can be hard to imagine. SpaceX calls it Stage Zero. It includes the orbital launch mount and the launch tower, which controls the complexities of propellant loading and all the other systems needed to make a successful launch. The system is even more complex than the Starship rocket itself. The giant machine SpaceX calls Mechazilla is not only capable of lifting and docking vehicle sections, but it can also capture the booster from the air, as demonstrated in recent tests. And in the not-too-distant future, SpaceX will test capturing the upper stage of the Starship as well. As we watch the cryogenic fueling, liquid methane and oxygen process, one thing to note is the launch timing of this flight. In fact, a key change from previous missions is the launch timing. Previously, SpaceX has launched in the early morning in Texas, and this provides the bright light of dawn for the moment of launch and booster capture as well as helps the Starship stand out as it flies through the flight phase before re-entering the atmosphere. However, that also meant that when the spacecraft re-entered the atmosphere, it would be in the shadow of the Earth. 
and the landing would be almost impossible to observe as it took place in the night sky over the Indian Ocean. This time, SpaceX decided to launch later in the afternoon so that it could collect more data on the spacecraft's re-entry and soft landing. And then, once again, we witnessed an amazing launch. What we were all paying attention to right now was the performance of the 33 Raptor 2 engines. Could they all work together and be powerful? And indeed, they did, together creating a huge force as the spacecraft rose through the dense atmosphere. Isn't that amazing? How do you feel about the complexity and innovation of the technologies SpaceX is deploying? Please share your opinion with SpaceNow channel in the comments section. With Booster 13, we see a huge amount of thrust, reaching an impressive total. Each of the 33 Raptor engines can produce around 230 tons of force. That's over 7,500 tons of force, more than twice the power of the Saturn V, the rocket that took humans to the moon more than half a century ago. This is truly a monster in terms of power. Surprisingly, this rocket has only undergone a very short test cycle, with the pre-flight static burn completed just a few weeks ago. This flight really looks like another perfect liftoff. The current spacecraft has demonstrated excellent stability. In particular, the beautiful angled photo clearly shows that all 33 engines are performing as expected. There is no sign of engine failure, and the engine smoke plume looks very even and stable throughout the flight. Next, the hot stage separation is always a dramatic moment, and this one was no exception. Both outer ring engines shut down quickly, leaving only the three center engines at reduced power. Then, the three vacuum engines on the upper stage and the three sea level thrusters fired to provide additional boost while also reversing the booster. As the booster reversed, the center engines fired in sequence. Since it no longer needed to push the Starship upper stage, the acceleration force was still very strong even without the outer ring engines. Look at the deceleration as the booster began to return to the launch zone. Will SpaceX be able to catch this booster like it did on Flight 5? We'll find out soon enough. Next came the engine cutoff, followed shortly by the separation of the hot staging ring. This time we got to see some great live footage of the ring being detached and drifting away. This ring is simply discarded for now, but in future designs it will be incorporated to ensure the vehicle is fully reusable. At this point, all systems must be working properly to perform a booster capture test. Will SpaceX give the green light for this test? We just heard the booster offshore divert announcement. Unfortunately, this means we can't do a booster catch. This is the only bad news of the flight, and the only thing that didn't go as planned. SpaceX officially announced on their website that an automated check of critical hardware on the launch tower and booster catch tower triggered a capture test abort. Still, this is great news because it means there's nothing wrong with the booster, just a problem with the launch tower. And even though we can't catch the booster, we still get some great footage of the booster landing closer to shore than any other landing before. Check out this footage of the vehicle descending toward Earth. The thrills really build as it enters the atmosphere and the speed increases rapidly. Even though the booster is still quite far away, we can't get a good look at the condition of the engine nozzles as they continue their descent. This distance is also a bit hard to compare with Flight 5, but the engines still seem to be not overheating as we prepare for the landing phase. You have certainly heard about this particular landing. It seems like a legendary moment with the shock cone opening and firing all 13 engines inside. A clean landing with the engines firing and then switching to the three internal engines at the end of the journey, later than the previous flight. And finally, it landed gently in the bay, but unfortunately, just as the booster was about to hit the water and explode, SpaceX cut the live feed. However, luckily we still managed to get that amazing moment, the violent explosion. Can you imagine? Although the booster is not designed to flip and survive, it still floated on the water for quite a while, even withstanding small explosions right after landing. As for flight time, 
The flight goals, according to Elon's tweet, were a huge success. Everything happened much faster than the previous flight of Booster 12. They kept 13 engines burning for longer and only switched to three engines near the end of the journey. In fact, this time, they maintained the engine burn for the entire 20 seconds, while the fifth flight had a burn of up to 25 seconds. This may also explain why Booster 13 did not perform a catching, but instead made a more powerful landing. But it wasn't just the booster. Next on the journey was the upper part of the Starship, where there was a big difference compared to previous flights. The Raptor engines shut down as planned, placing the Starship in a low orbit. SpaceX didn't have to do a full orbit, though. It simply put the ship into a natural orbit so that if it had problems with other test elements, it would automatically return and land safely in the ocean. After about 25 minutes, all attention turned to the next important test. This was the biggest change of the flight. SpaceX's first attempt to restart the Raptor engine in space, a crucial test for the future of the Starship program. You're probably wondering, why is this so important? Simply because this is a big step forward for Starship to operate more efficiently on deep space missions. Restarting the Raptor engine in zero gravity is quite a challenge. And fortunately, this test went perfectly, marking an important milestone in SpaceX's journey to conquer space. At this point, you may be wondering about the heat shield. On its previous flight, Ship 30 survived the high temperatures of re-entry with little to no damage. As a result, SpaceX decided to leave the heat shield intact, only adding protection to high-risk areas, such as the front wings. This saves weight, which is important when optimizing spacecraft performance. Thank you for watching Space Now channel. So what do you think of these exciting experiments? Will SpaceX continue to make great strides in space exploration? Share your thoughts with us. The more weight you lose, the more payload you can carry. Every kilogram that can be cut from this spacecraft means that you can add a kilogram to the payload capacity of the spacecraft. This is why SpaceX is constantly looking for ways to optimize Starship, especially in terms of the use of stainless steel. They want to explore the limits of this material, how to ensure durability and resilience while minimizing weight. What do you think about using stainless steel in space, a material that is very familiar to us on Earth, but has many challenges when facing the harsh conditions of space? For this flight, an important change is the way the spacecraft is protected. SpaceX has reduced some of the heat shielding on the sides of the spacecraft to test whether they can reduce the protective material without compromising the heat resistance. SpaceX not only wants to build the perfect spacecraft, but also wants to find a way to recover the spacecraft during future tests using a catch tower system in the future. This could significantly reduce the cost and time of construction, creating a new way to efficiently recover spacecraft. In the previous flight, the spacecraft flew only about 70 kilometers in the sky and traveled at a speed of about 25,700 kilometers per hour. But with this design, thanks to the more powerful re-entry, the spacecraft has reduced its speed by about 1,000 kilometers per hour compared to before entering the atmosphere. This is a significant change in SpaceX's strategy. During the live stream, many people expressed skepticism about the possibility of the spacecraft surviving the re-entry. But SpaceX isn't just testing the spacecraft, it's testing a crucial part of the process. Data. The data collected from these test flights is the payload portion of their test missions. If they lose the spacecraft during a test, they can continue with other tests without too much trouble. The goal is to produce the spacecraft so quickly and cheaply that they can afford to lose it during testing. These final images were absolutely stunning. This was the first time we'd seen a Starship fly through the atmosphere like this since Starship tests years ago. And then, in a perfect demonstration, the spacecraft landed safely, further demonstrating SpaceX's progress in spacecraft recycling. Even after removing some 2100 heat shields and using an older generation of shields, Starship was still able to overcome the challenge and hit its target accurately. This is a huge win for SpaceX, as they continue to test and optimize their spacecraft design. But what happened to the vulnerable parts? 
One of the forward wings has started to glow, a clear sign of intense heating. While we can't see the condition of the other wing, it's likely that it has suffered similar damage. The good news is that the damage is on the upper part of the wing rather than the lower part, which houses many of the systems critical to controlling the spacecraft. This is the risk SpaceX is taking to move forward quickly. One of the key factors that sets SpaceX apart is the relentless pace of testing and innovation. They're constantly changing the design and testing new improvements, whether the results are successes or failures. That was an exciting Starship flight test, and this was the final flight of the Starship Block 1 design. It's been an incredible week, and there's a lot more to explore in the days ahead. Finally, we can say that the testing pace of Starship is accelerating. Maybe the next Starship Block 2 flight will come sooner than you think. In addition, SpaceX is still rushing to complete the second new launch pad, B. After this flight, SpaceX said they will only attempt one more sea landing. If successful, SpaceX will test a turret capture. Once the first capture is successful, the game will really change. A fully reusable rocket, capable of delivering payloads to orbit without having to throw away most of it. At that point, SpaceX will continue to refine and optimize the design of both the booster and Starship to remove unnecessary parts, thereby increasing the payload capacity to orbit. And we will see them move to primarily delivering full Starlink version 2 satellites to orbit. Eventually, as launch frequency and reliability increase, they will test orbital fueling. That's right, a giant fuel tank orbiting the planet, so spacecraft like the human landing system Starship can leave Earth orbit fully fueled, ready to travel to the surface of the moon and return astronauts for the first time in more than half a century. So what do you think about Starship's full reusability? Could using reusable rockets significantly reduce launch costs, opening up new opportunities for space missions? Share your thoughts and let's discuss the future of SpaceX's space program. If you want to learn more about this impressive spacecraft, check out SpaceNow channel in-depth videos to explore the ways Starship could change the future and help humanity truly explore the solar system. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.